Hey, Das here, coming from my car. I was going to uh, shoot something in front of my computer like before with like the green screen, absenting out all my stuff, but I couldn't get the lighting to behave right now. Um, so the video you're about to see is um, a little bit ago, I did a video called Geometric Unity Workshop, and I took uh, Eric Weinstein uh, visiting Brett Weinstein's Dark Horse podcast, and Eric spent most of the time trying to metaphorically uh, discuss geometric unity and everything it was and kind of give Brett a sense of like what it meant and and uh, how to understand it and uh, and that workshop video if you've seen it it's like three something hours and it's me stopping and discussing out loud to myself and drawing things and trying to understand what they're talking about um, the video you're about to see is that same dark horse podcast episode but it's condensed down to about 24 minutes um, uh, since I did that workshop video, I, I went through the episode and, or, or sorry, I went through my condensed version that I did in the workshop video and condensed it again. And then I think I went through it one or two more times where I really condensed things down and put pieces of metaphor together, even if they didn't occur in the conversation together. And, uh, when he would use a metaphor for X and then he used a different metaphor for X later, I pulled those together so that sort of the building argument is more, um fluid and and like all together and sort of building upon itself um so i figured it'd be of use to anybody interested in this stuff so uh i'm including it here after this little intro um it's a little loopy to be honest with you like it like um we'll start in one place ex with eric talking about einstein and how him choosing a metric sort of locked things in and then we'll visit that same piece of the conversation later on in the video so that you kind of have something setting up the frame of the conversation. And then as things go on, once it comes back up in context, now that you have all these other pieces, you'll hear it again. And hopefully it'll be helpful in context. Um, so yeah, so this is a super condensed 24-ish minute version of the Dark Horse podcast that Eric tried to discuss, Geometric Unity. Um, that episode, uh, I'm going to include it in the description. Um, so you can go check it out. If you haven't watched it, you definitely should. Um, and if you're just looking for it, you don't want to use that link for some reason. It's called Brett Weinstein and Eric Weinstein, Fundamental Truth and How to Think About It. Uh, they posted it back in June 26th of 2020. So it's been a little bit. Um, this video, this condensation is really, it's going to have a lot of pieces. And I think it's helpful if you're trying to understand geometric unity. Um, but he's going to involve his like, what did he have here? His stereo metaphor, his tongue metaphor, and then his hairband becoming a paper a paper towel tube metaphor. So those are the, the main operational components. There's a lot of other details that are useful and important, and he discusses at length. Um, and so I think the thing to think about, the thing to consider, is that if I had to say my main takeaway ideas, it's like Einstein picking a space-time metric locked in certain things. And that I think what Eric's trying to discuss is there are two main components. One, Einstein doing that locked things in in a way that they don't need to be locked in. And that locked inness is part of why it's been difficult to unify everything in a unified theory. Uh, and that if we could get underneath that, if we get underneath the metric he selected for space time, Einstein, then we could like fix the geometrical understandings underneath. And then everything else is going to be gravy. Everything else is going to be easy. Quantizing everything, easy peasy. So part one, Einstein picking a specific metric, locked things in in a way that they shouldn't and don't need to be locked in. And then what Eric would say is instead, we need to take a look at the, like, the space of all possible metrics. And that's where we should be doing a lot of our physics. And then from that situation, that, possible, that possibility space, we can then kind of put a periscope in. We can kind of select and sample a piece of that possibility space that then becomes like our observable three slash 4D space, right? Three of space, one of time, our reality. And part two, or point two, I think would be his idea of the observers, that there's kind of a coupled set of two things, that like reality is two things that are not separate, they're coupled together, and there's like the observer and the observed in a way, but they interact dynamically. And one of the main metaphors he uses is like a stadium. There's the playing field where everything, the action's going on. And then there are stands, the stands where everybody's like watching. And depending on where in the stands you are, 
that determines what you see of the game and the other stands, etc. And there is a dynamic between them, but really that reality should be understood as this kind of stadium, stands observing, and the playing field, there's a game being played. And then they're both coupled together in a massive stadium together. That's the whole of reality. So the two main takeaways I would say. One, Einstein locked in a, a metric, and really we should be playing in the possibility space of all possible metrics, and that's where everything will start making sense. And then two, that uh, we, re we live in an obsiverse, which is like a reality where there's an observer and observed, and the coupling together of those two things, that makes up the totality of reality. So yeah, so I hope this uh, condensation is useful. Uh, feel free to leave comments if you uh, have I don't know why I would be able to answer questions, but feel free to ask questions. Or if you want to see a different condensation or you think I left out things that were super important, feel free. Um, in other news, I am also, I'm going through the Oxford lecture. I'm going to uh, link that below because I think they mentioned it in this video too. Uh, yeah, Brett does. All the, the uh, chalkboards and chalkboards of math. Um, I'm going to link to that video Eric's Oxford lecture below too. Um, I'm slowly going through that and making notes upon notes upon notes, but uh, I'm not an expert in math or physics, so it's taking forever. Uh, I'm learning a lot though, and I hope at some point here I'm going to make like a whiteboard video or something else where I will attempt to sort of go through my understandings and insights uh, about that lecture and everything that Eric's trying to explain, and, uh, and hopefully it's useful. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, enjoy the condensed version of Eric and Brett Weinstein talking about geometric unity. Einstein told us take four degrees of freedom, put four rulers and six protractors on top of them, which is the right number. Yeah. Call that space-time, and space-time generates curvature, and curvature is measured by the stuff floating around in the system. So you set the stuff floating around in the system, the matter and the energy, equal to the amount of curvature that comes out of the rulers and protractors, and you're done. Yeah. If you'd like, the augmentation here is not so fast. What if the fields, that is the stuff, the matter and the energy, the bosons and the fermions, are dancing across all possible rulers and all possible protractors? And what you're doing is you're sampling the rulers and the protractors on one particular choice. And along that, you're pretending that that is the world. If you're going to attempt to resolve any problems generated by Einstein, like black holes, why are there singular solutions, or the initial singularity, which we sort of mapped to the time around the Big Bang, or something like that, those problems, in my mind, and some others, indicate that there's something beyond Einstein. And if there is something beyond Einstein, you have to ask all the questions that I formulated inside of his world. Yeah. Do I know what their analog is in the larger structure? In this 14-dimensional auxiliary structure. Um, okay. So if I get you so far. Yeah. Um, there's, most people have a problem at the gap between three and four dimensions. They're uneasy with what it means that time is a dimension in some sense analogous to the first three. The first three dimensions are similar to each other. The fourth dimension is unique feeling but parallel, in some sense, to the spatial dimensions. Time is somewhat broken out as special, yeah. and somewhat not. Like, you can trade off small amounts of time for some small amount of space, but you can't treat time wholesale as space. Okay. So, so there's a weird way in which time is distinguished, and there's a weird way in which time is one of the, one of the band. But you're telling me that what I don't get is that that four-dimensional universe, that that thing is actually the training wheel land for a larger universe that I know from past things you said is 14-dimensional. Yeah. Okay? So I can sort of understand what it would mean to have a 14-dimensional space, but I don't understand how you would know if you're in one and what its implications might be. Well, people get very hung up because they don't understand that not all dimensions are visual dimensions or spatial dimensions. So, for example, very few people get upset when they buy a piece of uh, audio equipment and it says treble, mid-range, bass, volume, mm -hmm. reverb. Okay, well, that's five dimensions to me. Yep. And then they're like, well, that's not a real dimension. 
And they're thinking, and I'm saying, okay, well, now you're, and now I know what your confusion is, is that you've been told that dimensions are spatial, or visual spatial dimensions, and so you're going to reject every number that isn't three. Yep. Okay. And so I'm going to say, well, it seems to me like when you eat, when you order food, you're thinking about sweet, salty, uh, bitter, sour, pain for, you know, those chili peppers and heat. That's, so there's six dimensions going on your tongue before I even get started, and you're not freaked out that you've got six dimensions worth of taste, and the only problem is, is that you're trying to cram those into your visual cord. Well, how can I see them? Well, you don't see those tastes either. You taste them. So, you know, your, your mouth is at least six-dimensional based on what we just said. My point in this is, when it comes to pure taste, you've got four major kinds of receptor that we know about sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Those four receptors are like proto-space-time. It's like Einstein before he puts the metric, which is the rulers and protractors, on the thing that we call space-time. When you say rulers and protractors, yep. you are saying there are two different kinds of delta, where you want to measure the difference between two things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're talking about something analogous to a length, then you yep. need a ruler. Right. Sometimes you're talking about something that's you know, an angle difference. You want a protractor. Perfect. Yep. Those four receptors are like proto space time. We know, for example, that there's like a Scoville scale for pain for peppers. Okay, that's weird. That's a ruler. That's a ruler to tell you how how intense okay, sensation. Okay. My guess is that people who make artificial sweeteners probably have a sweetness scale. That's a ruler, and we don't know how the sweetness scale and the pain scale interact. How do I know whether sweet is very similar to sour? Or is it really that it's kind of opposites? You want a protractor. Yep. But we could do the whole thing visually. So for example, if I'm now holding uh, my glass of recently drained kombucha, and the rim of it seems to be close to a circle. Now, if space-time were just one circular dimension, yep. then I would claim that the enlarged structure, so in my theory, 4 becomes 14. Um, the one dimension, that is the one parameter, people will think a circle is two dimension. Again, it lives in two dimensions, yep. but because there's only one degree. You only, need a, you only need one number to say where you are in the circle. Just give me the angle. Yeah. Right? That circle would generate something of the one original dimension plus one dimension, which for me would be a way to measure length at every point on the circle. So a different ruler to measure lengths. Even the word length is a lie. You've got something that agrees with the concept of length in the realm that you're familiar with it, that extends into a realm that you've never thought much about. We took a word that you know very well, and then we borrowed it someplace where you really don't have any intuition at all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're talking about something analogous to a length, then you yep. need a ruler. Scoville scale for peppers, that's a ruler. The sweetness scale, that's a ruler. That circle, would generate something of the one original dimension plus one dimension, which for me would be a way to measure length at every point on the circle. So a different ruler to measure length. I want a rule that tells me how to measure length on the line tangent to that circle at any given point. So I want an infinite line at every point okay, good. tangent to that circle. Yeah. And then I want a different ruler, Scoville scale, the sweetness scale. A rule that tells me how I can measure distance along that line where it doesn't have to all come from one ruler that I place at every point. Why? That's the thing it's throwing. It seems okay. like one ruler that you can just tell it where to measure is good enough. Why would you want a special one for each tangent? Well, this circle in my story is the analog of space-time before it gets to become space-time. So call it proto-space-time, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Because what Einstein did, effectively, let's just make it weird, he said, take the four dimensions of taste on your tongue, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Come up with a different intensity scale for each of those things, call that a ruler. And then come up with angles between them. Einstein's principal insight was to say, I bet, this geometry is the right way to model our universe. Okay, so I, I get the, the analogy that's throwing me, but I can correct for it with the, the tongue. It's just it. four degrees of freedom that yeah. didn't come equipped with the thing that you're always going to say, like, I don't understand. 
We have rulers and protractors. Just go out and get one and measure stuff. Yeah. And the idea is, okay, well, on your tongue, you don't have that. So when you say rulers and protractors, yep. you are saying there are two different kinds of delta where you want to measure the difference between two things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're talking about something analogous to a length. Then you yep. need a ruler. Right. Sometimes you're talking about something that's uh, you know, an angle difference. You want a protractor. Perfect. Okay. Yep. What I don't get is what length and angle are analogized to. There is a gadget, which is effectively a combination ruler and protractor, and you have to extract length style and angle style information from it. And from that, mathematicians figured out, oh, it turns out you can recover curvature as a consequence of just having rulers and protractors, which is a highly non-trivial observation. We have a series of things that we do, like the idea of a tangent vector, when we have the rim of my glass, and I talk about the line tangent to the glass. I want a rule that tells me how to measure length on the line tangent to that circle at any given point. You could say, well, if you don't put your glass inside of a three-dimensional world, how do you know about the line tangent? And mathematicians say, ah, we don't actually need to put the glass and its rim inside of a larger space. We used to, but now we learned how to talk about tangent See, from the point of view of differential operators in Newton's calculus. Okay, good. So, all right, there's some sort of 14-dimensional space. You've well, let me just say a little word about that. Okay. Imagine that your proto-space time, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. This circle in my story, proto-space time. Imagine that your proto-space time was like an infinitely thin hairband. If you started off with an infinitely thin hairband, then for every point on that hairband, Imagine the space of all possible things that you might call of unit length, all possible rulers. Okay. And allow that a ruler can be either marked with positive numbers or negative numbers for whatever reason. Yep. But you're not allowed to choose the zero ruler. There is no way in which you can claim that everything is of zero length or infinite length. What I would claim is that the object that I would create, if I did the same thing, which I'm doing to four dimensions, turning it into 14, would turn the hairband into two toilet paper cores, the cardboard cores, which would be two disconnected cylinders. And you could see that the circular nature of the hairband would be represented in the circular nature. Okay, so I get it. So you, get a, you take a band, you've got a circle, right? This mm -hmm. uh, hairband of no dimension. Right and you stretch it across something, that gives you a tube. Well, what I would say is, is that along that tube is every possible, going lengthwise down the tube, is every possible ruler with the same sign. So effectively, you took a long tube, you cut yep. the middle part of the tube out, because those, that would be the degenerate metrics. So is this, you can't have one tube that goes from positive through negative, because you can't have that because then you would say that there are directions which can't be measured as having a non-zero weight, if you will, or pain scale or length or sweetness or whatever you want to call it, uh, relative to every possible thing. So remember, some things can only serve as rulers and protractors if they aren't pathological. When you say pathological, Thanks. We don't know of any way of handling the case where the rulers and protractors are effectively going to return zero for certain directions in all circumstances. So you're better off just saying, look, we can deal with this toilet paper tube and we can deal with that, that toilet, toilet paper, paper tube, tube and they don't right. connect, but that's okay, okay because, yeah, okay, got it. So now if we, if we took the hairband and then we said, you know what, let's, let's up our game a little bit because the hairband, you can't, there's no space. It's either all space or all time, depending upon whether you chose the plus rulers or the minus rulers. If you chose the minus rulers, it's all time. If you chose the plus rulers, it's all space. Okay, wait, you're blowing so, my mind. Stop it. Is that arbitrary? That you sort of. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, it doesn't tell you that space should be plus and okay. time should be minus. Then it just I tells it. you, I need some way of distinguishing some time from some space. And if you want to do everything backwards from my conventions, feel free to call space negative and time positive. Got it. So I was going to say, though, if you up the game and you say, okay, now I want to play with two dimensions, so I have one time dimension and one space dimension, at least that starts to sound like reality because space and time are different. Yep. 
So then you'd be in a two-dimensional world, and you'd have one ruler in the time dimension, one ruler in the, in the space dimension, so think about a watch versus an actual ruler, and you'd have an angle between the two, which would be your protractor. So that'd be three pieces of, of extra data. And then if you threw out just the way you cut through that, like, let's say, paper towel core, to have your positive and your negative, now you've got three pieces of that three-dimensional space of two rulers plus one protractor, two in the wings, we call it a butterfly, and then there's one that kind of goes around. And those three things would be the three different possible signatures. Two, two of time, none of space, one of time and one of space, two of space, none of time. So those are the three possible ways of dividing up two dimensions into three, into space and time. All I'm trying to get at is Einstein told us that Space-time is four dimensions, four possible degrees of freedom, with rulers and protractors, and the ruler that goes in the direction of the time is of a different nature than the rulers that go in the direction of space, and there are six angles rather than, in this case that we just did, one angle, because there was only one time and one space. And that is where we begin the puzzle, which is how does one disintermediate Einstein. So in this situation, what I would say is Einstein threw away all but the space-time metric that he believed in. So in other words, he didn't allow the stuff in the universe to dance on top of the rulers and protractors. He just chose one set of rulers and protractors, and then he said that the stuff in the universe is engaged in one equation called the Einstein field equations with that stuff. What Einstein did, he said, take the four dimensions of taste on your tongue, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Come up with a different intensity scale for each of those things. Call that a ruler. And then come up with angles between them. This geometry is the right way to model our universe. To be blunt about it, the really weird thing about my theory is, is there anything with almost no evident structure whose consequence is us? because there's tons of evidence structure. Okay, that's beautiful. I've never heard you say that before, but it dovetails exactly. Okay, so in this case, for yep. example, that simple hairband where you shrink the radius of that little tube down to an infinitesimal amount yep. generates a paper towel core that falls into two pieces. Turning that into the analog of space-time is wrapping that hairband in some way around the towel core so that it goes around once. Wait, wait, wait. You've lost me. The towel core, I thought, is was the, the space extension of all rulers that could go at any point. So just move the bit of the hairband up so to the... So if you put the hairband on the towel right. roll, then you, can, you could mark every space, and then you could move it up and down, and that would tell you which rulers... And you could move using. it up over here and down over there, so it's got a big ruler at this point, oh, okay. a small... Cool. But it, the idea is that each point on the hairband only goes through one ruler, which is represented as a, the, the space of possible each, rulers. Each point on the band intersects exactly one point on the tube. One point uh, of the longitudinal lines on the tube. Every point in the hairband only intersects. goes through one line along the lengthwise direction of the tube. Yeah. Okay? Got it. So that's a choice of a particular ruler. The line along that tube is the choice of all possible rulers. So you can order any ruler you want from Amazon. We'll customize it. Yep. Okay, I want this ruler for this point, Scoville scale, this ruler for that point. Sweetness scale. Okay. Okay. Now imagine that you had physics that was happening not on the hairband, the sweetness scale, but on the tube, in your tongue, and which, like, you could ask for the temperature gradient across the tube. Maybe part of the tube is warm, part of the tube is cold. And the only thing you're going to record is what the temperature was like at that point on the tube. The, that the instantaneous hairband, measure. At that point that the hairband was around the tube. Yep. That is effectively the new use of the space-time metric. We knew about rulers, we knew about protractors, but we don't have a model in which that is a periscope importing information from the tube 
Back to the hairband. In yeah. my case, what I would say is that the hairband has enough data to build the tube, which is, tell me about the space of all rulers I could have at every point on the hairband. Yeah. Measuring the tangent directions. How do you know about the line tangent? We learned how to talk about tangency from the point of view of differential operators in Newton's calculus. Then on the hairband, now that the hairband has generated the paper towel core, now I do physics on the paper towel core, like it can have fields, effectively yep. stuff, that roam around on the towel core that are natural for the towel core. And I say, well, can I perceive all of that? No, you can only perceive the part that's along the hairband. So, and then the idea is that we're fooled, in my story, right. into thinking that the physics is all happening along the hairband, which is, in, in our case, the four-dimensional world. But the physics is actually weirdly happening on this 14-dimensional auxiliary structure, which is the analog of the toilet paper or the, the paper towel core. And we're only sampling the part through the periscope of putting the hairband around at one particular latitude across those lines of longitude. Many worlds is a very particular quantum mechanical concept yeah. due to, I guess, Everett was the popularizer of it. What I would say is, in an observerse, which is the, the structure that contains both the hairband and the paper towel core, yep. I, I analogize that to being like you're going to attend a soccer game or a basketball game. And you have stands and you have the pitch. And so the stands are where you perceive what's going on in the pitch. And the pitch is like the towel core, the, to the, to the uh, paper towel core, the yep. cardboard. And the stands are like the hairband. And so you're only sampling some of what's going on from every particular... Like you and I went to the same game, yep. but we saw different things because you were seated sure. on the floor and I'm up in the bleachers and I don't see many universes, I see one observerse. And the one observerse is a more rich structure in which you would be confused if you thought, like I'm the only person that exists and I happen to be sitting here in the stands and you saw that guy get pushed across the way. I said, I didn't see him get pushed. It was like, you have a different view of the action. You saw things I never saw. There's more going on than I could perceive in my seat. I get that, and that I like that. You know, the game took place. There was one reality of the game, and there were an infinite number of possible edits based on where you were. There were an infinite number of places you could. I view like what from. you just said. Okay. Let's fix the geometry underneath both general relativity. This is great. What I'm what I'm hoping. Yes. My prediction is that if you do that, if you fix the geometry, then many worlds goes away. Well, because in part, what you're calling a world yeah. may be a, perfect, a particular way of placing the hairband around the core. And yes, there are an infinite number of ways yes. of placing the hairband around the paper towel core. All right, so we should probably figure out how to close this up. Obviously, <laughs> my sense is that what you have described is exactly what I was hoping you would do, which is the sort of intuitive version of what it is that you do and what the sort of thing is that you think you found. And then there's a, there's probably 20 chalkboards full of math that mirrors what you're saying. And the added value for most of us for the math on the board is probably zero or near zero, right? The point is, if the math is right, then what you have just described is likely to be true and that that would resolve many of the things that cause us to get... Well, look, uh, what I'm, if you want it at that level, what I would say is, Einstein told us, take four degrees of freedom, put four rulers and six protractors on top of them, which is the right number. Yeah. Call that space-time, and space-time generates curvature, and curvature is measured by the stuff floating around in the system. So you set the stuff floating around in the system, the matter and the energy, equal to the amount of curvature that comes out of the rulers and protractors, and you're done. Yeah. If you'd like, the augmentation here is not so fast. What if the fields, that is the stuff, the matter and the energy, the bosons and the fermions, are dancing across all possible rulers and all possible protractors? And what you're doing is you're sampling the rulers and the protractors on one particular 
choice, in this case the hairband around the core, and along that, you're pretending that that is the world, and that's the universe, and that's us, and our fate, and when did the world begin, and in some sense, you're asking, you've learned to ask an entire set of narcissistic questions based on your particular perception of the observers. And the observers is about the pitch and the stands being part of the stadium. If you learn to stop asking questions about your experience of the game, and you ask, well, what game took place yesterday? How many people, how many different things did they see, and what took place on the pitch independent of what I was able to perceive as taking place at my seat, you know? Mm -hmm. Then you, you start to understand, like nobody would talk about the many games hypothesis where every single person experienced a different game last night, you know? And then there are ways in which the stands interact with the pitch because everybody's yelling like, miss, miss during a free throw, right? Yeah. And so you also have to deal with the fact that there's a way, way in which people who aren't supposed to be part of the game become part of the game. Now, I love this, that the indefinitely large number of different observations of the game do not imply more than one game. There's a lot more game than physics currently thinks is going on. That's my belief. All right. Well, that's very cool. 